Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Joe Kuzma and Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast brought to you in part by Total Sports Enterprises. Uh, My name is Joe Kuzma, and yes, uh, I would like to thank our previous sponsor, MyBookie.ag, as we move on with a different sponsor. And folks, if you missed it over the weekend, I did, as I will attempt to not clear my throat, sniffle and everything else because I was sick, but Mean Joe Green... Uh, the now grown up boy from the Coca Cola commercial, and also Jack Lambert and Shake and Bake. Uh, Ryan Shazier and Vince Williams were all signing autographs at the mall at Robinson for Total Sports Enterprises. It was a good time had by all. And there are many more of these opportunities coming in the near uh, future here. So keep an eye on all of our social media for that as well as Total Sports Enterprises on all of their social media and at tscshop.com. If you missed out on anything, you know, if you're just looking for a jersey or a mini helmet or something like that, you could always find it there as well. And when the Steelers win, there's always a TSC Total Impact player of the game, or in this case, a unit, which we're going to talk about here very shortly. So there's a very limited time special that you could catch, but only when the Steelers win, because we don't necessarily celebrate when they lose so I'd like to at this time welcome my co-host who is in a different capacity today than usual we're usually paired up together maybe on the WTF podcast but Brian was busy and apparently since I'm sick and everything falls on me I'm really gonna guilt trip him on this one (laughs) but I'm muscling through this Terry you're supposed to give me some advice on what else I could take Uh, you're gonna tell me probably like tea or lemon or whatever the magic potions are I just screamed my head off at Heinz Field too so my voice is just gone for two different reasons but how are you doing so far today I'm doing great. I'm actually in Pittsburgh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, at my hotel, there was a ton of Yensers, I guess you call them, but Pitts- Pittsburghians, I guess, uh, coming in for the game and stayed over last night. And so it was really fun breakfast time where everybody had on their garb, wanted to talk Steelers, and I was surrounded. So it was great. I told you it would be like that everywhere you turn around. I mean, it's it's literally no joke. There's uh, there's a few movies that are out there. There was The Next Three Days. There's Jack Reacher, something else that's escaping me, where someone just throws on like a Pittsburgh ball cap outside of one of these games, uh, be it Steelers or Pirates or whatever, and they get lost in the crowd. Except the one movie, like the detective or the FBI agent or whatever, actually points the person out in the crowd. I may have mentioned this on the show before, actually, and I'm like, and I just called BS on it. I was like, there's no way you're going to find somebody like that. You, I get, I, I lose like friends and family in these crowds, and I know what they look like. Uh, you know, it's not just based on some, well, there's like a six foot tall, you know, guy that's you know kind of looks like this with the beard white guy or whatever I think it was trying to remember who it was well you know Tom well Tom Cruise isn't six feet tall but aside from the point (laughs) I'm getting off track uh yeah I told you it would be like that is definitely a a, game days are, are second to none in Pittsburgh and they're definitely second to none when the Steelers Come away with a victory, especially when they come away with a victory in the AFC North against a foe that they have just had their way with. It's like the, I don't even want to say little brother anymore. The Cincinnati Bengals are just, they're on an incredible losing streak against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not that I'm really crying. There were some fans outside of Heinz Field that were, and they were having some fun teasing some of these Bengals fans that were walking out. Yes, Bengals fans did come to Pittsburgh, or maybe they lived there and they did whatever. And they're saying, hey, you need to fire Marvin Lewis. I said, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Keep Marvin Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Depending yeah, on your perspective, but... keep Marvin Lewis. 29 to 14. Uh, your first comments before I dive into this. Well, I th- I think, you know, it's hard to say because I, I'm never sad when, you know, when they lose. I mean, the Bengals to me, I don't, I think they're dirtier than the Ravens are. The Ravens to me are a foe. You know, it, it's, it's hard fought. 
you know, it's, it's definitely gets bloody at times, but it's physical football. This one, I mean, you've got perfect in there. And again, don't get me started on that kick in the head to Knicks and, you know, just some things that they do that are just so suspect. I guess that's the thing. But the biggest thing to me is I actually felt sorry for Andy Dalton at the end of that game. He was getting killed back there. I don't know where his offensive line was, but three sacks in a row and he was just getting killed. He actually, you could tell his frustration by throwing the ball away on fourth down. I was like, what are you doing? There were some Bengals fans that were sitting there next to me as well, and that was primarily their comment was he just threw the ball away, and it's nothing's more Andy Dalton than throwing the ball away like that. And you know the game's like it, it, you know you need to move the ball, you need to get a first down or do something. And although I will say there was a point somewhere in the game where he went to scramble and he immediately like folded like a deck a, like a bad hand in poker. I'm gonna say right. <laughs> he just slid, he hit the deck so fast, like don't hit me, don't hit me. Well, uh, you were there live, and so you saw that, but we're listening to Tony Romo who's calling the game, who's phenomenal, by the way. He just has such a football IQ as a quarterback. And he, he was like, Andy, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, you can't throw the ball away on fourth down. you got to throw it to somebody. He goes, you know, even if it's intercepted, you you got to give your team a chance. Like, throwing it away doesn't do anything. So, Yeah, and, and what, what happened was on that series – they get the ball with about five minutes left. Um, as Dalton was sacked uh, by Cam Hayward right up the middle of the field. His short left to Gio Bernard went for – actually, they lost a yard. And then um, Tyler Croft, the tight end, was stopped, and it was fourth and two. And then he just, like, threw it, like, into no man's land. So, I don't know. It was uh, – that was interesting. I, I don't know. It was a tale of two games for sure because it was. the Steelers' offense was – they were looked like they appeared they would be a well-oiled machine finally in the first half, and you could tell I'm congested. It's, it's, I'm getting nasally here, so I apologize. It's not a microphone or a connection thing or anything like that. But I seriously am losing my voice here. But um, the Steelers' offense of uh, just. I don't want to say dominated because everybody felt, hey, they should score more points. I felt the Steelers were going to put up 30 just on offense. I, I had a bold prediction of 40 points for the game uh, based on I thought there might be a defensive touchdown. And try as he might, Will Gay, you could tell he knows that if he gets another pick six, he breaks Rod Woodson's franchise record for pick sixes, right? Try as he might, he did not want to go down without a fight. And he tried to stay on his feet and keep that going. And that was kind of fun, but I did make a nice, bold prediction that came true. I felt this team would get two interceptions on the day. I called one for Joe Hayden, just right on the money. I thought Mike Hilton would get one here, too, but he did not. Uh, but Will Gay, uh, pretty much slot corner or dimebacker, however you want to view his position that they move him around now, kind of in the same capacity of what I was thinking when they're targeting tight ends or slot receivers or and et cetera, et cetera. So two interceptions by the defense and there was a, a running joke that the defense had uh, I think Eric Herman had actually said something from here and he said something on Twitter or tweeted out like who would have thought the Steelers defense would have more interceptions than sacks and then all of a sudden the sacks just started coming in the fourth quarter as in the second half it went from the offense not being able to move the ball one yard in several instances to the defense just totally taking over and I gotta say this is another curse for the Bengals they played renegade at their practice during the week to try and prep for it you cannot prepare for this that it's just it's a curse. It's just the same way as when Jeremy Hill took the terrible towel and did whatever with it before. Guys, just give it up. Don't play Renegade your practices anymore because as soon as Renegade hit, the game was over. Uh, it, it was like uh, life was – there was a new life in the stadium and the defense just ate Cincinnati alive. Yeah, it's, it's funny though because in this game – and we always talk about, you know, we won and – in, sometimes in close games, we're mad that we only won by. Um, but the one thing that that was funny to me is that in the in the first half when we scored so fast, I was like, oh, "This is great!" And then they scored, and then we scored again, and then they scored. I'm like, "Oh gosh, it's going to be one of those games." But then in the second half, just seeing that you know that golden to DHB fake punt, and then the hide and seek celebration, and 
you know, it was, there was just some fun things going on. So between pounding sand and laughing and all that kind of stuff was good. But you know what, one thing that I, I, I want to ask you, what happens there live when every time when we're third and long, Todd calls the same play of run the ball and we get nothing. What well, happens in the, in the? I mean, does it just get quiet there? Mm, yeah, there's not necessarily boo birds. There'd be boo birds if they were losing. Um, it, it's got to be really ugly. Probably the ugliest boo bird scenario had to be a few years ago when Ben was hurt, and you had Michael Vick playing. Uh, remember him getting booed against the Baltimore Ravens, uh, maybe even the Arizona Cardinals, and then uh, Landry Jones gets announced to come out, and people just booed him instantly. They did not like him whatsoever. They even booed him uh, when he got like his one start at, at home against the Cleveland Browns, the, the infamous game where Ben Roethlisberger was the backup, and he comes in after a series because then Landry got hurt. <laughs> And the, right, and then everybody's cheering. It was just kind of like I, I, I don't necessarily like that uh, from the fan base when they. I just think it's lowbrow. Um, yeah. it, it support everybody. I mean, uh, what did Landry ever do for you? And the funny thing is, is Landry came in that game. That was against the Arizona Cardinals, and they came from behind and won. Uh, and it was like uh, it was a shootout. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but when you get back into this game, it's just it's tough when you're seeing these third and longs, third and eleven third and 12, and you're like, just throw the ball. Well, you're just trying to figure out what, what Todd Haley's actually doing out there. Yes and no. And just a case in point with the Sunday night football game, for example, there was something where um, Matt Ryan, I think, threw like a short pass. It may have been Devontae uh, Freeman or Tevin Coleman. One of the running backs got it. And then he carried it the whole way and got, and got a first down. And there was something very similar to that, I want to say, in the Steelers game. It's a little foggy. Uh, now i got to go back and watch some film. I want to say there was something similar to that. And it doesn't always work. Some of that's just a, a part of field position. So if you're vying on special teams for a field goal, for example, just get you know a few yards closer or maybe get on a certain hash mark, that's more, more or less that type of stuff happens when you're trying to win the game or you're oh, yeah. near to one of the halves. But and also with punting, too, you get a little bit of an edge there maybe um, in the field position game. And if it breaks if it breaks open, it breaks open. But on the other hand, it, when you have the, the third and, and one situations, I think there were three of them where they didn't get it. I want to say Terrell Watson, the nightmare, was out there, and he hasn't lost a yard running the ball at all this year. And he still got stopped for no gain, so he didn't technically still hasn't lost a yard carrying the ball. They, they, I don't know. Sometimes it's like um, I think Big Al got blown up on one of them for like a loss. Uh, it, it sucks. It's like, uh, well, you could see that coming. Well, then when you pass the ball, what are you supposed to do? So it's like a chess game. It's like it's it's strategy. You're, it is, but you then know. when you saw that one right before the half, I think Ben and Mike Tomlin were frustrated because, I mean, good for Boswell. I mean, he five for five on his um, field goals, but there was a, we were trying to get a, a touchdown obviously before the half and it looked like Ben ran a play and then I, I don't, like somebody was supposed to call timeout and I think it was supposed to be Tomlin. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was supposed to be Ben. Somebody was supposed to, and they didn't and they only had time for a field goal and Tomlin was pretty hot, but Ben was even hotter because he came over to the side and you can tell there was some kind of an exchange with him and, and Mike, not that he was mad at Mike. He was just like, you need to give me a chance there for another play. And he was like, I tried. You could try to lip read, you know, on the screen. But that was that was kind of interesting. Yes, actually, that was this was it right here on um – they ended up with a defensive pass interference, which was so blatant. Yes, um, with yes. Drake Kirkpatrick, who got just right. he got bullied today. Uh, Le'Veon Bell just smacked him into the ground on a stiff arm. <laughs> he that was did. Just, that, that was awesome. Uh, he got it, you know that's what they say by being posterized. He was posterized uh, yeah, on Sunday, he was. and uh, and then his pass interference where he just grabs the back of like a Antonio Brown's collar, uh, like his nameplate on his jersey. It was like, did you think they weren't going to see that? It was so painfully obvious. So they ended up with the uh, first and five at Cincinnati five-yard line with, uh, let me see here, 16 seconds left to go. And they had... Now, this is interesting. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm reading it here. I, I thought they had two timeouts, but I guess they only had, they had one. one timeout still right. left. And so they hit an incomplete pass to Vance McDonald, which... 
Uh, I'm not sure what it looked like on TV. He should have caught it. Live. Yeah, and I, and I kind of thought the way he ran the route, and if I get to rewatch it, it almost looks like Ben threw it where he just came from, and he kind of had to kind of put on the brakes. And well, that's no excuse. Turn. It was real on it his. Was a fade. Yeah, yeah. He was. It was. It was through his hands though. So when it goes through your hands, it doesn't matter what you had to turn and twist to do. You should have caught it. Yeah, he needs some stick him on the gloves, and he does. He ended up getting hurt, and I, I absolutely loved seeing all the tight ends in rotation today, uh, or yeah, for the game. And um, so Vance doesn't get that. I uh, actually had a great video of that. I may have tweeted it out uh, to be honest, because um, I was like right there, like right in the end zone, back at the end zone. Um, where I was sitting. So uh, that was incomplete and that stopped the clock. So there's 12 seconds left, uh, shotgun again, and they're on the five and they go to run uh, Lev Bell uh, to the left and he loses a yard and it's like 12 seconds. And for some reason, nobody calls like a timeout. It's third down. They, they had the ability to call a timeout there, run another play, you throw it, whatever, and you, you should be you should be okay, barring anything, barring a sack. Really, that's the only thing that would have totally screwed them out of any points. And considering how things went, the Steelers they didn't get to, no sacks, no turnovers, one penalty for five yards. It was a phantom defensive holding call earlier in the game, and I'm like, oh great, here goes the officiating again. There may have been one pass interference call I felt where Antonio Brown was targeted in the uh, end zone, and he got pulled by his shoulder pads. Uh, yeah, just that by should have been sleeve. a sleeve. That should have been yeah. Yeah, so that one's gonna go up on the website, of course, with the human. But don't call. didn't didn't Ben get sacked once, or did he get rid of the ball and just got knocked down? Nope, nope, uh, no sacks. Bengals gave up four sacks uh, for the and game I for he thirty-two got yards. Once. Like, I saw him on the ground, so it must have been that. The ball ended up getting – he must have got rid of it, but it looked like he was hit. Yeah, and uh, I'm looking at the official statistics here too because, like, the one with uh, Cam Hayward, I was like, oh, okay, that was, like, right behind the line of scrimmage. So te technically, statistically, it was a sack on Andy Dalton. So uh, they did a good job of protecting Ben uh, all day long. The Steelers, though, 2 of 11 on third, third down efficiency, 18%. Yeah, the Bengals were no better, 3 of 11. Um, they were 1 of 2 on fourth down. Oh. Uh, the fourth down play is really killing me. We've seen this. I think this is the third time now we saw it against Jacksonville. We saw it against Chicago where they pull Artie Burns and Joe Hayden off the field for LJ Fort and Tyler Matikiewicz. And then the linebackers, no matter who it ends up being, one of the linebackers does not end up covering somebody. In this case, I think it was the tight end, Tyler Croft. So they got a touchdown on the fourth down there. And I'm like, I, I mean, I, I don't understand that personally. Um, we've seen it three times. It hasn't worked three times. It's kind of driving me crazy seeing that again. And then um, in the red zone, of course, Steelers one for six. One for three, goal to go. Uh, but they did dominate the game, total net yards, 420 yards to uh, the Bengals, 179. So I could say, at least with some comfort here, looks like the offense, while they still have some woes with short distance, third down, down efficiency, red zone efficiency, they're... There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like there's improvement on the other side. The defense, I was worried, well, they hadn't been playing maybe the best of competition, but it really looks like the defense is for real this year. It does now. Did did James get any snaps? I thought I saw him in there once. Um, he moved around a little bit, and there was an instant somewhere, I want to say in the second quarter, he was speaking with an official, and the official was he was talking to him right on the line of scrimmage, and then James got pulled. Oh. And yeah, he got pulled and they sent, uh, did they send TJ back out on the field? I think uh, Chicolo may have been out there with James Harrison. I'm trying to remember. And uh, they either sent Chicolo out or TJ Watt back out. And then I think the Bengals ended up calling a timeout or there was a penalty. And then James Harrison came right in. So they never even played the snap that he got pulled for. Uh, he was out there a few times during the game. Um, I'm really fuzzy because there aren't any snap counts at this time. They usually publish those a little bit later in the morning. So, right. uh, yeah. Well, I'll, the reason I'll, I was asking sure. is because the, the first half, it didn't look like there was any pass rush on Andy Dalton. And then oh, no. the second half, they were absolutely all over him. So somebody had a conversation with somebody. And I personally, as much as I'd like to see James get 10 or 15 
you know, snaps a game. I just want to see the pass rush. So, and we did see it the second half. So it doesn't matter who the personnel is. But I have a question for you because you're out there. Oh boy, you're right by the goal line. So you know, we're we're you know we're seeing this on TV, which personally I think we're warmer and probably have some good replay action. But you see things we don't see, which is kind of a fun you know perspective. And as much as I love those touchdown celebrations, I love the hide and seek. I was laughing my head off when I saw that. Especially when Juju's running. Well, first of all, um, it showed that uh, AB didn't know what was going on. He's like, what are you doing? And it looked like him and Bell knew what they were doing. And so, you know, he starts counting to 10. And then, you know, Bell hides behind the post, which I'm glad they didn't think it was a prop. And then he goes and gets him. But he acted like he was seriously six years old the way he was running to go get him. And you're just like, you just know that, you know, Tomlin's over there with the eye roll. But here's what I did, Joe. I timed it. And it was eight seconds. And to me, we haven't been going for those two-point conversions. And I'm wondering if that's why. Um, I think How long point... does it seem like out there? This, I guess is my question. You know what? It, sometimes it seems like a, a blink of an eye. And sometimes it seems like an eternity. It, it's, all, it's all relative. You know what I mean? Like, what, you, you yeah. have like a, everybody's had like that day at work or you're at a doctor's office and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and 10 minutes right. feels like two hours. And it's kind of the same deal. Or it's two hours feels like 10 minutes because everything goes so quickly. So eh, half a dozen one way and six the other is what I will say. But I don't know. The two-point conversion thing, I'm not so upset set with not seeing them try for that I think I think that's just part of them not being so efficient in short distance situations this season where they've kind of scrapped it because I think they tried like early on they may have had like one or two attempts or they had like one that was like uh they had to uh, abort because the the penalty uh, or there were there was almost a delay of game penalty. It was a delay of game. Yeah, penalty. that's and that's what I'm thinking. I was I was wondering, but there was no chance for them to do a a two point here, only because I'm sitting there going, I'm like, okay, six, seven, eight. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, it was funny, but I just can't believe there hasn't been a conversation about that unless they've decided just to take, you know, I mean, later on as we get into the the season and you know we're playing, you know. I don't want to say better teams, but teams that have kind of figured us out a little bit more. I think that they're going to have to be careful with that. So it just, it was just, I'm just wondering as far as down the field, I'll say more about that on my WTF, but I was just curious since you were there, if, if there was a, a time lapse, like slow motion going, hurry up, hurry up, because Juju actually tweeted something out thanking the NFL for celebrations. He's such a kid. <laughs> he's such a kid. I love it. But he really a... is. It's it's funny. And even my wife, who's the Cleveland Browns fan, got a kick out of it. And uh, you know what? I, speaking of getting a kick out of things, um, TJ and Bud Dupree, a little bit better dancing on the celebrations. I know we'd probably put yeah. that in the WTF category <laughs> when we get to it. And uh, – uh, later in the week, but uh, yeah, you know what? There, there's a good, there's a good point to bring up too. And not only, um, I think John Ledyard, who had been on the show before, last word on Steelers and oh, what else? John writes for somebody too. He's all over Twitter. He's one of these draft guys. He's a big Steelers fan. Writes too. for Scout. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, with with uh, Jim Wexel. Right. Um, so. Uh, J John tweeted out something or other about, you know, hey, let's start. T we need to start talking about how ridiculously good Joe Hayden has looked in a Steelers uniform. And myself and Brian actually mentioned this uh, one week ago when we broke down the Kansas City game that his name doesn't get called too often. And he came up with uh, a, a pretty big play in this one. There was a pass downfield. Uh, let me see. I mean, A.J. Green, oh, I wish I had. I lost Andy Dalton's numbers for the second half, but he was miserable. He ended up being 17 of 30 for 140. I think bad. it was 12 of 16 to start uh, the first half, I think, is the number I saw. And then, of course, do the math, and he was just awful for the rest of the game, including the picks. But A.J. Green, how often do you see A.J. Green against the Steelers? Three for 41 yards, not very often. The other one was, too, I wanted to say with Bud Dupree and T.J. Watt, first of all, there's some, I don't know, there's like some little pocket of fans out there who they're 
getting in my ear, Brian's ear, you may have seen this too since you're always on our social media as well, about Bud Dupree. And they're starting to yeah. label him as being a bust or whatever. He has three sacks now for the season. He appears to get pressure. He's always getting back there. He's trying to get his hands. When you said there wasn't that much pressure in the first half, he was still getting back there, but it's just the the timing, you know, Dalton's getting rid of the ball faster, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, you got TJ Watt, who does not look like a rookie by any means necessary. He, of course, he's going to make some mistakes. Uh, he's still not a very experienced or veteran type player, but he is every bit the real deal. It makes me just, I think to myself uh, and speaking with others uh, about the same topic, Wow, they get this guy with the 30th pick in the draft. It's just, yeah. wow. Well, you know what's interesting about Bud Dupree and, and what people say as far as, you know, I, I can't believe they say he's a bust, but I was thinking of tonight about a couple of things because people were, you know, when, you know, obviously people have their opinions about who is doing great, who isn't. The one thing I noticed about two of our players, and one is Bud Dupree and one is Nix, and then obviously it used, it, it, at times it's Harrison. I notice them more when they're not on the field. When they're not there, when they're when they're there, obviously you notice them. But all of a sudden, and what I mean by that is, when they're not there, it's like things aren't happening. And all of a sudden, they come into the game, and nobody hits harder, I think, except for Mike Mitchell than Bud Dupree. I mean, he can out be out there and just annihilate somebody. But Nick's, I mean, he got off the field, I think, for one play, and all of a sudden we didn't have any movement. And then he gets back in there, and all of a sudden we're seeing, you know, Bell charge down the field. So it just, to me, I notice more when they're not in there because then things aren't getting done. And when they're in there, you're like, okay, here we go. Kind of like Hayward. Remember last year when he was gone, we're, we're like, okay, we missed that guy who can raise up and bat, bat it down and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you know he's playing, his, you know, his butt off this year. So, and I thought actually – Ben had a great game. I thought yes. Ben just had a great game today. So Only 24 attempts, and Le'Veon Bell, uh, 35 carries. Let's also give Mike Tomlin a shout-out for getting James Conner in at the end of the game. Yes, and, and that was giving, great. Giving Bell a breather for <laughs> – I, like, I yeah. think people would have seriously freaked out. And then they just ended up in the victory formation. You know, Ben doesn't ever want to leave the field. So, um, right. yeah, you know – there was a play somewhere, one of these uh, third and ones or short yardage situations, and they pulled Rosie Nix off the field. Yes. And it was one of those situations. Um, they had a three wide receiver look, I believe, and Bell went nowhere. And it was right. just like, now, if you could take that and just take that snapshot and then take that against everyone who leading up to since – last weekend with the whole Martavis Bryant getting traded thing, which uh, is a whole – that's a WTF segment all its own. Ian Rappaport it wasn't is. wasn't even giving it up as of Sunday morning. He was still mentioning it on NFL Network. Oh, he's not going to get subbed out as much for Eli Rogers or Juju Smith-Schuster. Well, it's hard to get subbed out for Eli Rogers when Eli Rogers was inactive for several games. So yeah. it's just a ridiculous comment. Now, Bryant – Pretty much non-factor, targeted twice. Uh, he had one catch for three yards in this game, and but which is funny about so he's more involved now. Oh uh, well, you know what? He may have been on the field more, but he definitely was downfield blocking. I know he opened. He had a great block on one of these uh, Bell plays. I don't know if it was one of the little short passes a little wheel route or something of that nature. But I, I recall it sticks out kind of indefinitely in, in my in my memory here that he was down the field. And it's these small things. And we've heard Ben say, hey, there's nothing he's doing wrong at practice or anything like that. This is just – this is kind of somehow – sometimes how it shakes out. And Well, and that's what people have to realize. Being involved doesn't necessarily mean being a target. It means being mm -hmm. involved to help the team win, which could be – Blocking, open up pockets. I mean, look at Juju Schuster. He's on my, or Smith Schuster. He's on my um, my fantasy team, and I it's hit or miss every week. It was a hit this week because he's a great blocker, but he him. It seems like it's it's A B and him right now being targeted, which I personally love. I love Martavis Bryant as well because his speed. Once he has that ball, his speed is faster than both of them. But for some reason, those other two are just getting open a little bit more. So, you know, but just I wanted to say something about Joe Hayden that you were mentioning, you know, last night uh, here in Pittsburgh, you have something called the Tom Mike Tomlin show at 1135 at night on, on their local channel, too. And he was talking about Joe Hayden 
And it was kind of funny what he said. He said, you know, he goes, that guy just, you never hear about him. And he goes, and I don't want to hear about cornerbacks. If you don't hear about him, it means they're doing their job. He said, but when I come into the building and I see him and I see him in a steeler wire, he goes, I'm pretty happy. He says, I, I just, I feel very thankful. I can't remember what he said, very blessed or something, that he's one of us. He says, you know, I just, I, I'm just pretty happy that he's one of us. He goes, I just can't believe, oh, I pinch myself is what he said. That it, you know he's one of us, so it was it was it was cute. He was you could tell he's always been a fan. The way he said it, he really likes Joe. It, it, it's fun too because just in talking, as people know, friend a lot of friends and family of mine are Cleveland Browns fans. My wife, Cleveland Browns fan, they said. I'd be talking a lot of smack about how Joe Hayden just jumped ship so fast. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, we do for sure. So one closing thought on that, though, with the whole Martavis Bryant or whoever getting a, a receptions, catches, production, the Steelers have gone up against some pretty heavy artillery when it comes to secondary so far. The Vikings, yeah. uh, you know, they have uh, Xavier Rhodes. Uh, they still have, oh, geez, uh, Terrence Newman, who used to play for the Cowboys and even uh, – he used to play for the Bengals, too, I think. He's been around forever and still playing. I'm not going to say the Bears have a great secondary, but, you know, hey, the Bears beat the Panthers. so And that's one that I picked for my upset special of the week, by the way. <clears throat> so Ravens have a, have a very exceptional secondary as well. The Jaguars, we found out, Jalen Ramsey is the real deal. And I think they had Barry Church that they had signed up from the Cowboys. And so they had a very good secondary. The Chiefs, Marcus Peters, uh, they didn't have Eric Berry, of course. Uh, he was gone. So they're, they're a little damaged. They're a little on the backside of that. But then the Bengals secondary is also very strong. So I think as they move forward, I mean, you look at some of the schedule that's coming up, uh, now, uh, you can flip a coin on the Lions, but they have the Colts, and the Colts is not a strong defense what, whatsoever. There is Vontae Davis, but, I mean, Antonio Brown burned them last year for three touchdowns in one game. Uh, the Tennessee Titans do not have a very strong defense, nearly choked against the Cleveland Browns. Uh, that one went to overtime. The Packers, a mirror image of the Steelers' defense, still trying to figure things out with their secondary as well. Yeah, but remember you, the Packers, they don't have a quarterback. Yeah, of course. So, But I think my, just my point here is you, in these next four games, I think you're yeah. going to see things open up a little more with the passing game. So. Yeah, I think, I think so too. Well... And closing moments, I just wanted to say, I give a shout out um, to my friends over at the Stiller Gang. That's S-T-I-L-L-E-R, their hospitality and whatnot. They're a fun bunch. They are a Pittsburgh Steelers fan club. And if you've never seen the giant banners that hang in the stadium, these guys, they travel from all over. And they even have like a UK chapter now and a German chapter. And they have a terrible tailgate every home game so if you're hanging around you got to get in touch with some of these guys you can find them on facebook they have like a bajillion more like likes and followers than what we do uh they could use some help on twitter though they're a little lagging behind there but they're very active they do a lot of fun stuff they they bring like um like a banner that say it says this is Stiller Gang turf and they'll bring it to like Cincinnati and hang it on the Welcome to Cincinnati sign and it's just a real fun bunch so I wanted to thank them uh, for all of the fun on Sunday of course and give them a real quick shout out and there'll be something that goes up as far as our fan club spotlight uh, later in the week and you'll get to see how some of that goes and they got a few more parties going so if you happen to come down to Pittsburgh and you're looking for something to do and you could party and hang with the rest of them. These are the guys that definitely check out. They go by uh, Bang Bang Stiller Gang, BB, uh, hashtag BBSG, which is just awesome. They got a whole gimmick thing going. It's like the almost like a Punisher skull with the with the three stars from the Steelers Steel United Steel emblem uh, that goes with that, and a hard hat and the whole nine yards. And they got all kind of merchandise. They always got guys like Mike Mitchell and stuff wearing their wearing their paraphernalia. So uh, a real fun group. So I wanted to thank. Uh, especially uh, code name. They have code names too. I want to get a code name. Now I took a picture and I put it out um, over on SCU Twitter and Instagram and whatnot. I got, I, I got one of the bandanas around and I think I need like a code name like banger has, but I don't know what mine is. So just tagged me as Joe Kuzma and <laughs> it was still fun though. They're, they're a raucous crowd to be around. So wanted to give those guys a shout out. And of course my co-host Terry Fletcher, 
Well, and it's always good, and I'm glad I'm in Pittsburgh, and I'll get to see you tomorrow night. Yeah, we will definitely um, reconvene and have some more things to talk about with football. And if you have some more things you would like us to talk about, fan clubs, whatnot, whatever it may be, 203 um, 904 SCU 4728. Nearly forgot the phone number there, but you know what? Send us a text message, leave us a voice mail, uh, in our mailbox. That's cool too. We have the inbox, we have the regular email as well. Fan mail at steelcityunderground.com. Several people have sent those through. Brian's coordinated some of that. If you haven't heard back from us, just hey, give us a bump. We do get busy here, we have deadlines to meet, and these are incredibly hard to do. We may not be back on sharp Monday morning due to Sunday night football. A lot of primetime games late afternoon starts going forward. So also helps that Terry is usually on California time and she could join me today. So thank you. Very gracious. I'm glad you enjoyed your day in Pittsburgh as well. And until next time, everyone else be safe, be good. Thank you once again for listening and supporting Still City Underground and we will catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media. And our website, www.steelcityunderground.com.